Hello and welcome to Cool Time Life. I'm your host, Steve Prentice. Last weekend, much of the world changed its clocks once again, as we do twice a year, meaning that no matter when you listen to this podcast, thank you for doing so, by the way, no matter when that happens to be, you are no more than six months away from having to do it again. And you will also be reminded by your local fire chief to replace the batteries in your smoke detectors each time. It's ironic, really, that the time change that happens in the fall does so now in November, a month whose name was given to us by the Romans like all other months, and which was originally the ninth month of the year, hence its name. Novem is Latin for nine or ninth. It's interesting that so many things we hold on to, despite living in a world of change, keep on being the same. There are not many cultures in the world that still celebrate and worship the gods of Roman times. The countries now play host to a range of religions, yet we still hang on to these Roman and Norse names for the months and the days. Why do we stick with that? Is it tradition? It certainly cannot be out of loyalty to Roman gods. They haven't been in favor for centuries. Now, next, look at the keyboard on your computer or your phone. It is still laid out in that QWERTY style, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, the style of keys that has been around since typewriters first made their appearance in the late 1880s. This layout of keys, the name comes from the first five keys on the top row, it's far from the most efficient. In fact, it was created to prevent the jamming of the letters, which used to be mounted on rods or sticks, in order to strike the inked ribbon. People just typed too quickly, and they jammed them up. So the letter combinations that are most commonly used in English are spaced furthest apart in order to slow down the typists of the day. There is also an apocryphal story that points out that the word typewriter can be typed out using just the top row of the keys, meaning that typewriter salesmen of the day did not have to learn how to type in order to show off the product to customers. This fact, if true, has a direct echo in the world of commerce today, especially in the area of electric cars. Stories abound of old-school car salesmen burying their new battery-powered models far back on the lot, unwashed and unloved, because they themselves cannot understand them and do not know how to sell them. In all these seemingly disparate cases, the continued use of Roman names for the months, the continued use of the QWERTY keyboard, and the reluctance to embrace green vehicles, these all point to an overall resistance that is at the heart of change management, as well as to the fact that despite all the progress we have made, there are still some things that we want to keep old school. Now look at the other item that I mentioned earlier. The thing you're supposed to attend to each time you change your clocks, the smoke and CO alarm. Most people still use the old school smoke alarms, those white plastic pucks that say do not paint in white on white letters that are impossible to read and whose batteries always start to fail at 2.30 in the morning, depriving people everywhere of sleep thanks to their incessant chirping. I did some research, by the way, on why they tend to fail in the dead of night rather than at a more convenient time during the day, and it has to do with the drop in air temperature that happens in most houses during the night, either because of the relative cool of a summer night or the thermostat being programmed to drop a degree or two when everyone's tucked into their beds. Whatever the cause, a quick drop of a degree or two is enough to trigger a smoke alarm whose detector is becoming faulty due to the failing electric current of the expired batteries. Anyhow, the point of that explanation was to say that this need no longer be the case. Smart detectors connected to the Internet of Things are now much better able to alert a homeowner and family members of a problem using a clear human voice, and also messaging to smartphones. And the intelligence of machine learning to distinguish between the heat variations that might happen during the cooking of a meal versus a real problem are now possible as well. In other words, we might soon be coming to the end of an era where we no longer need a fire chief to remind us to change the batteries twice a year when the device can do it for us. So, time marches on and innovation marches alongside. It might be viable to play devil's advocate and state that not everyone in the world can afford an intelligent Internet of Things enabled detector for their home. That might be true. But the same might have been said about cell phones and smartphones once, yet imagery from the most desperately poor parts of the world, including refugee camps everywhere, show people carrying smartphones. They have truly become universal. So, did I drag your ears all the way out here just to talk about smoke detectors? No, not entirely. 
They represent the types of changes that could and should happen in the world, but for some reason do not. Look once again at the QWERTY keyboard. Why do we still have it laid out like that? You don't even need physical keys anymore. Keyboards could be entirely based on clear glass or on laser projections on a surface, and some already are. And these could be configured to arrange the letters in any way that you want. Alphabetical order, vowels on the left, consonants on the right, your favorite letters grouped closely together, you name it, you can have it. And the argument that you need consistency so that all computers operate the same and that everyone can use them will not be an issue when any of us can download our personal preferred keyboard layouts from the cloud and drop it into any device for as long as we want. But there is another argument that says it would take too long to train people to change the way they type. But given how quickly humans have learned how to use things like Facebook without any prior computer programming or data processing education, such theory stands on shaky ground. These are all just some of the things that people just cannot let go of due to a comfort with the past that pushes stubbornly into the future. Look at flex time, for example. How can you trust your employees to actually do work when they're at home? Well, I for one look at end results and the nature of the back and forth communication, and I balance that against the reality that no one ever puts in a solid eight hours of work per day, even when they're in the office. It's not possible. If an employee has to work from home and has to put the laundry in or go to the gym or go and pick up kids from school, so be it. It's the quality of the work that counts, and by and large, happier employees are more motivated to make that happen. Lifelong learning is a similar challenge. It's difficult for the powers that be to let go of the idea that the only good education is classroom-style education, when in fact more can be gained from smaller courses delivered more frequently and delivered in accordance with the individual's own learning style. And I say that as someone who has delivered classes for years. I welcome its demise, quite frankly. Now, back to the clocks for a second. How many clocks do you have in your home, including in your car, that you had to manually adjust when the time changed? Because you'll have to do it all again in a few months. Except, of course, for those on your smartphone or your computer or your connected smart devices, they will have changed themselves through their connection to the Internet of Things. Now, imagine a world where every timepiece, not just domestic, but industrial, medical, you name it, anywhere that we keep time, Imagine the day when they are all connected to the Internet of Things. You might say to me, are you suggesting that those clocks will change themselves? Well, yes and no. I'm not suggesting that all these clocks would simultaneously leap forward or backward an hour at the appointed date. That would simply be automating an antiquated process, the digital equivalent of putting lipstick on a pig. But no, what I want to see is the day when all clocks adopt a timekeeping system that eliminates the need for the one-hour leap entirely. If it can be proven that we still do need to make this change of one hour, which is something I'm not entirely convinced of, since its reasoning seems to be solely one of economic convenience, but if we still have to do it, then why not have all clocks adjust themselves by one second per hour, 20 seconds per day, in some sort of leap second format? It might not be as easy as I make it out, but surely someone has already thought of this. I cannot believe that a global manual resetting of clocks is in any way more practical. Imagine if things were the other way around. Imagine if there was no clock adjustment at all right now, we just lived with the seasons as they are. And then someone came along and suggested that every home, factory, and hospital in the world should manually reset their clocks twice a year. It just simply would not fly. And this brings me to a final concept, which is connected to these earlier ones, again by time and tradition. The concept called Net 60. Now, anyone in small business soon discovers that if you want to do work with large companies, you will have to come face-to-face -face with the accounting department, and they do not move comfortably into changing times. You will discover that work done today and invoiced at the end of the month will then be processed over a 60-day period from the time of receipt of the invoice, a process that in total, from the time of the work performed to the time of actual payment, could be three months, longer even if your bank holds the check. This places the onus on the small business owner to hold on to enough money to live for three months before payment arrives. Now, terms like net 60 or net 30 or even net 90 were put in place to protect the cash flow of large companies, helping them to be sure they could cover their own costs and recoup their own receivables before paying off the help. 
And to be sure, according to the golden rule, which reads, he who has the gold makes the rules. Such a policy has been the way of business for decades, and it's unlikely that any accounting department would be willing to change that up and expose a company to shorter-term financial risk anytime soon. Except for the following, maybe. In this age, there is now a new alternative. Point-of-sale and remote payment systems like Square and even PayPal mean that suppliers can get paid by customers immediately, securely and directly, without relying on clearing systems like banks or accounts payable departments. Now, the giants might scoff at this, but what it means in terms of supply and demand is that the best suppliers with the best quality and the best price will go to the best customers. Those being the ones who pay promptly, as in within minutes, not months, of completion. Now this, by extension, means that companies who stick with an antiquated cash flow system might find themselves committed to hiring and using secondary or even lower quality suppliers. The best and the brightest will have already paired up with equally minded entrepreneurial companies. It is said that people always drive into the future with their eyes fixed on the rearview mirror. We hold on to traditions and procedures because that's how it was back in the day. But next time you shop online, next time you pay online, next time you call for an Uber or connect to a Skype conference, think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Sometimes it does make sense to move forward into the future, and that means more than simply adjusting your clock by 60 minutes in the spring. So, there you have it, my podcast on the Daylight Savings Time, Net 60, and why they both need to die. A list of all of our podcasts and their related blogs is available at steveprentice.com, that's S-T-E-V-E-P-R-E-N-T-I-C-E, under the Podcasts tab. You can also drop me a line through the contact form on that same website, and you can follow me on Twitter at Stephen Prentice, so S-T-E-V-E-N-P-R-E-N-T-I-C-E. And by the way, if you are looking for an entertaining keynote speaker for your company's next event, I have a humorous one called Not Secure, which pokes fun at a whole range of workplace and technology challenges. You can find out more about that at steveprentice.com as well. So until next time, I'm Steve Prentice. Thanks for listening.